So I, I, it's my turn, right? Okay. Hi, everyone. So welcome. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Edward Chan, who is the chair of neurological surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Chan's clinical ex expertise uh, is a surgical therapist for epilepsy, pain, and the brain tumor. He specializes in advanced neurophysiological brain mapping methods, including awake speech and uh, motor mapping to safely perform neurosurgical procedures in eloquent areas of the brain. Uh, in fact, he just uh, told me that he performs like uh, 300 uh, surgeries a year, which uh, really amazed me. Uh, Dr. Charles' lab has demonstrated the detailed functional organizations of uh, the human speech cortex. Uh, Dr. Chang is the co-director of the Center of uh, for Neuro Engineering and uh, Prosthesis at uh, UC Berkeley and the UC San Francisco. Uh, he's the 2015 Bolivarnik National Laureate in Life Sciences and a member of the National Academy of uh, Medicine. So I, I did a search on the web basically uh, to to see this award, what, what it is basically. Here's a, a description of a, for a Vatinic uh, National Award. Uh, it honors America's most innovative uh, young faculty rank, uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, this award celebrates the past accomplishments and the future potential of young faculty members working in the three disciplinary categories of uh, life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering and the chemistry. So Dr. Chang's research really has made a lot of impact and actually frequently appeared in the news. In fact, uh, uh, there is a recent uh, New York Times article about uh, his research, which is on the front page. I think he will talk about that uh, today. Uh, essentially, that's about uh, how he could uh, manage to get the people who couldn't speak, who lose uh, speech uh, ability, to speak again by uh, brain computer interface. So the kind of procedure he's uh, producing, as well as uh, there's a lot of uh, machine learning to understand uh, the brain activities. So it's a uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I think he's uh, right at the interface between machine learning and the brain science. So it's nice really to have him to come to ICM to talk about his research. Today he'll be talking about uh, encoding and decoding speech from the human brain. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, you can always uh, use the uh, Rocket Chat. Uh, within the talk, you can you, you can just write your questions. Later on, then uh, we'll be answer, answer those questions. So you can you don't need to wait to the end, but you can, you can really write uh, once you have the question. OK, let's welcome him to, to talk. Hi, Tom. Um, hi, Marita. Thank you so much for inviting me to to speak at ICML. Well, you know, what a huge honor. Thank you so much. Um, to me, it's a very special honor because machine learning is so critical to the work that we do now. And I'm not someone who's trained in computer science, but I do have to say that it has completely revolutionized our work. And I hope to interact with the machine learning community even more as time goes on, because I think it's very, very fundamental to the future of our own work. Uh, today, I'm going to give you a lecture about speech motor cortex, it's the part of the brain that controls the vocal tract, and how we understand how this part of the brain works when we speak, and how we're using that knowledge to build what we call a speech neuroprosthetic device, something that can essentially translate brain activity into words. Over a hundred years ago, one of the founders of neurosurgery was a neurosurgeon named Harvey Cushing. And he described in this picture, this is what in brain surgery we call craniotomy, where the bone is removed and you see the surface of the brain. The writing that you see there is the part of the frontal lobe. It's the very back part of the frontal lobe that we call the motor cortex. 
And the motor cortex is a map of the body. And each part of that map corresponds to a different piece of the body, a different part of the body. For example, the face, the corner of the mouth, the lips, the jaw, the tongue, and in fact, the vocal folds. This is something that Harvey Cushing described over 100 years ago. And our understanding, actually, of how this part of the brain works when we speak is, is very unclear. As many of you know, speaking is a hallmark of human species. It's a very, very complex kind of behavior that we almost all of us do at effortlessly. The way that speech is produced is that air is expired through the lungs and then a noise source in the vocal folds continues up the vocal tract and then gets filtered by the shape of the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. Mm -hmm. It's the shape that's created by the lips, the jaw, the tongue that give rise to all of the different consonants and vowels in the language. It's a very complex motor skill. Some people say it's the most complex motor skill that we do because it requires a coordination across over 100 muscles in the vocal tract. And because when we normally speak, it's relatively fast on the order of 120 to 200 words per minute. It is by far the fastest way that we transmit information. The main <clears throat> approach that my research involves actually relies on the volunteer participants of my patients who have refractory epilepsy. And in some people who have refractory epilepsy, they have some part of their brain that is causing uncontrolled seizures. But we need to figure out where the seizures are coming from. So we do a surgery where we can implant many electrodes on the brain surface to figure out where the seizures are. And this process usually takes about 10 to 14 days in the hospital. And during that 10 to 14 days, we can have people participate in some studies where we look at the brain activity while we're waiting for their seizures. This is a 256 channel array, it's 16 by 16 channel. And when someone speaks, you will see the electrodes, the sensors that are recording directly from the brain when someone is speaking a given sentence. Shoot building is a most fascinating process. Right now, this is one of the most important ways that we can do human neuroscience because it gives us both spatial resolution, but also temporal resolution. And what I'm going to show you in the next 20, 30 minutes in the first part of this talk is about how each little electrode here is representing information about speech. All of these individual sounds that are being played out in this part of the brain to give rise to speech. One of the first projects that I will describe is a project that was carried out by one of our engineering graduate students named Ben Dichter. And this project was about <clears throat> essentially a part of the brain. He discovered a part of the brain that's very important for the control of the vocal folds to change the pitch of the voice. Brain activity in this particular area, when it increases, increases the pitch of the voice. This is both when you're speaking, but also when you are singing. The larynx, which is the voice box here, as I described earlier, is the source of speech, the noise signal that comes through the larynx is created by the vibrations of the vocal folds as air comes through them. And that creates a signal that we call voicing that's filtered from. But it also gives rise to pitch. And that happens through the tension of the vocal folds. So for example, we English speakers use pitch to change the prosody of the voice. And for example, from uh, this example that Ben used from Reddit, you can change the meaning of the sentence by changing the pitch of a given word in a sentence. For example, I never said she stole my money versus I never said she stole my money. 
the emphasis actually has a lot of implied meaning. The first one implies that it was someone else, not me. Whereas the second one is that the emphasis that it was never something <clears throat> that was said. What you are looking at is the lateral aspect, the outer aspect of the human brain. These are the electrodes that correspond to changes in vocal pitch. What you're looking on on the right side, each one of these blue lines corresponds to a single trial where the subject was saying each one of these sentences for a single word was stressed. <clears throat> and we group all of these trials together when they stress the word I or never said and so on. And what you can see is that the neural activity at this one particular electrode is plotted below. And the neural activity at this one particular electrode is tracking the pitch of the voice, but not specific to the individual words or consonants in it. So this is an example of a part of the brain that is controlling the pitch of the voice, but not the consonants and vowels. Then also found that this area <clears throat> was active and could correlate with the pitch of someone's voice when they were singing melodies like Do Re Mi. And he also interestingly showed that when you play back these sounds to people, that they in fact have auditory responses that are delayed. So this is an area that has both auditory response and motor control of the larynx. Another project that was spearheaded by Josh Chartier and Gopala Anamachipelli was to really look at articulatory kinematic trajectories when people are speaking different consonants and vowels. And this refers to everything that's above the level of the larynx. You can see my lips and my teeth and my jar. Moving, and that's what gives rise to these individual sounds. And that's a challenge to study that. <clears throat> the muscles of the vocal tract and of the mouth are very complex. The muscles of the lips, for example, operate as a sphincter, not as a two-dimensional or um, not joint-based. The tongue, for example, operates as a hydrostat. These are very complex physical structures that have many degrees of freedom. One of the ways that we can measure this in our human subjects is very simply by using some color uh, face paint, which is non-invasive, and to use extraction using computer uh, methods, vision methods, to extract the movements of the lips and jaw when people are talking and correlate that with the brain activity. And what I'm showing you here is an example of some of the data that we can get that tells us about the information that's included by single, single electrodes, for example. So this is an example of an electrode in the speech motor cortex human. And what you're looking at is what we call a mid-sagittal or midline view of the vocal tract. So this means upper lip, the lower lip, the lower incisor, which is the lower teeth, the tongue tip, the tongue body, and the tongue dorsum as well as larynx. And time is represented by the thickness of the line. So what this is basically showing you is the movement in this pictorial illustration of the different parts of the vocal tract that are encoded by this one particular electrode. So in this particular case, again, time is encoded by the thickness of the line, where the tongue tip moves forward and back. The lower incisor goes up and down. The tongue body goes down and then back up. So the main gesture here that is being coded is that the tongue tip moves up and the, and the jaw comes up in order to create a particular, what we tell call an articulatory trajectory. We think of these as low dimensional uh, movements that are speech primitives. Again, there are high degrees of freedom throughout the vocal tract, but in reality, when we speak, 
there is a low dimensional set of movements that gives rise to all of the speech sounds. These primitive movements are coordinated. They are not based on single articulators, for example, the tongue or the lips. It's the coordination of these movements. And they tend to have an out and back profile, whether it's the lips closing, the tongue tip moving up, or the tongue dorsum going up and down. So I'm going to give you some examples here to show you what I mean by this. When you say the word dad, all of you should try to say dad, you will feel that the front of your tongue goes to the back of your upper tooth, dad. And that's a critical movement in order to make that sound dad. In linguistics, we call this a coronal trajectory. This electrode encodes that kind of movement. In this movie, it basically shows you the kind of movements that are represented in this one particular electrode. The tongue tip moves forward, the lower incisor goes up and down, the back of the tongue goes down. So the back of the tongue comes down and the tongue reaches forward. And that's what's critical for the duh sound. Let's compare that with a different sound like pop. The p sound is what we call labial trajectory because as you probably imagine, it involves the closure of the lips. Try saying that word pop, pop. Your lips actually have to close in order for that to happen. Different electrode, which is less than a centimeter away, is encoding this kind of movement where the lips are coming together and then opening, where there's not much movement going on in the tongue. So you can see that this one electrode, which is nearby, has very different encoding of movement compared to the other. We looked at hundreds of electrodes. This is just a subset of those that are plotted in this hierarchical cluster, dendrobar. And this is just an unsupervised way of sorting and clustering the data to see what the structure is like. Each column here corresponds to a single electrode, and each row corresponds to the activation and displacement of the different parts of the vocal tract, such as the larynx, the tongue, dorsum, the display, the tip, the upper lip, etc. And then underneath this is all of the 40 different phonemes in the English language. Okay, all of the different consonants and vowels. The point of me showing you this figure is that across all of these different electrodes, we now have a dictionary uh, for all of the different movements of the vocal tract that are in the speech as well as all of the different phonemes in the English language. And these things are naturally related. So um, the summary is, is that from this scientific study and people who are speaking, we now have much better understanding of how this part of the brain controls the movements of the vocal tract to give rise to all of the different phonemes in the English language. Now I'd like to take the opportunity to switch gears a little bit and to talk about other work that we've been doing that has to do with engineering what we call a speech neuroprosthetic. A speech neuroprosthetic is a kind of technology that we are working on to restore speech to people who have lost it as a function of a neurological injury. Uh, the image that you see here the idea here is that we want to use the brain activity for someone to control something like a virtual vocal tract, an artificial simulation of the vocal tract to give rise to words and speech. Uh, many of you know that uh, there are certain kinds of neurological conditions that can interfere with the ability to communicate or talk. This includes conditions like stroke, ALS, and cerebral palsy. The most severe form of this is called locked-in syndrome. It's called locked-in syndrome because patients are locked in and they have no way to communicate, usually except for their eye movements. In most cases, they have cognition and awareness, but paralysis of nearly all voluntary movement. It is a truly devastating kind of condition. And the most famous example of ALS is um, the late Stephen Hawking. I like this particular quote where he says, although I cannot move and I have to speak through a computer, 
in my mind, I am clear. So one of our goals is to really be able to tap into the mind in order to have a way for people to improve the rate of speech and quality of life. This is a, from a review paper that we wrote last year where we compare the different communication rates across different modalities as measured by the words per minute. So natural conversational speech, kind of like how I'm speaking right now, is on the order of 120 words per minute. Conversational can be about 200. Professional typewriter, about 75. Um, using text screens and predictive text, 60. Eye tracking, just using your eyes and predictive text, about 20 words per minute. Handwriting, about 15. BCI stands for Brain Computer Interface, Urban Control, Cursor Control. So uh, many of our colleagues have done tremendous work using brain activity to control a computer cursor to try to type out words. And that's currently maxed out at around 10 um, words per minute. Recently has become more, uh, almost up to 20. So these are different communication rates. And the point of this is to say that speech is very special. The information that we convey in speech is very, very fast compared to other modalities. And it's very special. It's a very special part of being human is the ability to speak. Now, there's many things that you could do, as you could imagine, if you want to decode speech from the brain. Um, in our particular research, we've been trying to predict movements or decode movements from brain activity and those movements we use to generate sound through a speech synthesizer another process is by trying to decode phonemes individual letter characters um, which we can use a language model to output text so here are two potential outputs for speech one is sound and the other is text one of the uh, earlier papers that we did on this was to essentially try to synthesize speech from brain activity alone. And the way that we did this was to build a two-part decoder. In some ways, you could think of this as an encoder-decoder framework using two uh, systems, uh, two uh, LSTM recurrent. neural networks. The first part of the decoder takes the brain act and tries to essentially decode the kinematic movements of the vocal tract from the brain activity. A separate module here essentially is trained uh, essentially on, not on brain data, but trying to understand the mapping between the kinematics to acoustics in speech. And we can use this using a lot of acquired data that we have from linguistics, where people have done measurements of the vocal trial as people speak and the paired acoustics, and we can infer the movements of the vocal tract and then train a model that can help us do the second part of the decoder, which is decode the acoustics. So the first step is to decode kinematics, which is movements from the brain activity. And then from the inferred kinematics, decode the acoustics and translate that into synthesis. In this paper that was published in Nature in 2019, we report that it is possible to synthesize speech from brain activity. This was done in people who spoke normally. This was not in a paralyzed person. And if you look at the spectrogram, the frequency versus time, for two sentences, this is the original speech for these two sentences. And then if you compare that to what we could synthesize just from brain activity, again, frequency as a function of time, it's far from perfect. But you You can see that it does capture a lot of the critical energy that was pre present in the original spectrogram. 
you can see a lot of the energy is in the right part of the spectrogram. Uh, the envelope energy is all consistent there. And, but it's missing a lot of the fine structure, the very fine frequency information. And we're working on that now. The way that we did this, again, was to go from brain activity to some intermediate state, which was a virtual kinematic representation of the vocal tract. These are the kind of movements that we're trying to decode from our model. And from this, we synthesize to, um, to audio. So uh, this was uh, covered in the news. Uh, it was the first time that we and, um, and other people that we uh, collaborate in our lab and other scientists around the world created speech from brain signals. And the prosthetic voice decodes what the brain says and mostly understandable speech. Okay. Now this was just based on brain activity. In this movie demo, you're going to see the brain activity of someone who is speaking. You will see what is the decoded kinematic movements from that brain activity. And then you will hear the synthesized speech from the brain activity. You will first hear what we synthesized from the brain activity. And then you will hear what the person actually said in order to compare it. Okay, you will first hear what is synthesized by the decoding. And then you can compare that with what the person originally said. The proof that you are seeing inside no only works. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. The proof that you are seeing inside no only works. She building is a most fascinating process. Ship building is a most fascinating process. She building is a most fascinating process. Okay, so what you just heard was the synthesis of words and speech from the brain activity. And again, this was using a two-part decoder from brain activity to movements of the vocal tract and from movements of the vocal tract to, to uh, sound. The second part of the decoder is trained on data that maps the relationship from kinematics to the sound. The first part of the decoder is just the mapping from the brain activity to these movements. Many of you are used to thinking about end-to-end -end systems. And you may ask the question, why not just go end-to-end? -end? Why not just from brain activity to the sound? And that is certainly possible. Um, we are interested in things that are biomimetic because we think that it will be easier for people to learn. It'll be natural, it'll be faster to train. So um, we, we, we looked at it. And what we found was that if you use a biomimetic articulatory intermediate, it requires much less training data. So the MCD is the distance, the mean capture difference between the original and the uh, synthesized speech. And the amount of data that was required, uh, essentially, for the synthesis to decrease. Lower values are good uh, with the MCD. And you can see that when we use this intermediate model, we can um, get down quicker than if we try to do a direct um, decoding of brain activity to sound. I suspect if you had enough data, they will converge. But the point here is try to be thoughtful about an intermediate representation so that you're not going uh, from um, the brain to sound, especially when you're constrained by data. So the lesson here is really about the thoughtful use of an intermediate representation in order to reduce the amount of training data. There have been other approaches that we've had. So as I alluded to earlier, we've also tried to decode text. Um, the same sentences from brain activity using uh, techniques in, in that were very, very powerful machine translation using sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning. 
Um, many of you know that uh, algorithms like Google Translate, um, at least several years ago, were using um, um, encoder decoder frameworks uh, using uh, workaround neural networks. And uh, many of you are experts in this, so I won't go into detail on this. But um, we essentially did something uh, similar and very much uh, inspired by this work. Um, the feature selection is the front end of this. We extract the high gamma signal of the brain. It's the, um, a very specific component of the brain signals that we extract. We essentially do a temporal convolution on that uh, signal, and we generate essentially uh, sequences of features. Um, we develop an encoder recurrent neural network that develops the internal uh, hidden state using a, an auxiliary of uh, the predicted uh, capture coefficients for some of the acoustic properties, and then a decoder RNN that outputs um, the predicted text. This work was done by Joe Mankin, uh, who was a postdoc in Europe. So this is the encoder RNN and then a decoder using a sequence to sequence learning algorithm. And this is the network architecture that, that, um, that Joe developed. So when we compare it against other algorithms for text decoding, um, for example, if we were to use a phoneme, a character-based HMM, um, the words the word airway was about probably like 40. Um, without the auxiliary, it was about 10. Uh, if we subsampled from the features, meaning low density, it was about 10. If you use all of the data using the auxiliary, <clears throat> using all the feature extraction, using the sequence sequence, we could get down to as low as 3% word, uh, three word area, which is very low. Um, so this is just proof of principle that you can use some of these uh, frameworks with enough data to get low um, to get very high accuracy and lower for the errors using sequence to sequence technology. Everything that I just showed you was in people that were normally speaking. And we just wanted to see if just using brain activity for someone speaking, uh, if we could decode uh, the text or the audio. But because we had that in hand, we decided to start a clinical trial. We call it the Bravo trial. And the Bravo trial recruits people who are paralyzed. Uh, the first participant in this trial is called Bravo 1. And he was paralyzed because of a stroke that he had 15 years ago. Um, Tang Zhang um, mentioned that there was some coverage of this in the New York Times last week. And his story, it's a very beautiful story about the participant who volunteered to be part of the trial. <clears throat> He can produce very limited vocalizations, but not intelligible speech. So that's just an example of his vocalizations. And instead, he uses this stick that is attached to his baseball cap to type out things at about five words per minute. Very laborious and very difficult. He can do this because he's got some residual neck movement but he can't speak, and he's actually paralyzed in his arms and legs. This is a, uh, a picture of his MRI that basically shows, <clears throat> you see this big chunk missing from the brainstem, and that's where he had a stroke. So the brainstem is the part of the brain that connects the brain to the spinal cord. And when this area is injured, the signals that need to come out of the brain cannot go out to the vocal tract or come out to the spinal cord cord, which goes out to your arms and legs. So this was really just the first project um, in this study. It's just the starting point. I don't want you guys to get too crazy about um, expectations about it. Um, it's really the first thing that we were able to try. And just in this example, the subject sees a question on the screen. And then he tries to answer. OK. So the way the algorithm works is it reads the cortical signals through an array that's implanted, surgically implanted over the brain. And it's connected to a small connector that we can um, do uh, analog to digital um, conversion as well as amplification and uh, 
filtering. This digital head stage is connected by a wire to a computer that does the following. The pipeline includes uh, taking in the raw signals in digital form. Uh, we do signal processing on it to extract the relevant features. The first step is an algorithm that does speech detection. It's detecting whether or not he's trying to speak a word or not. Then it, it takes those detected events, once it's detected, and attempts to classify what word is he trying to say. In this particular first project, we started with a 50 word vocabulary. 50 words can generate approximately 1,200 different sentences. At least the 50 words that we chose uh, can generate 1,200 different sentences when you combine the words in different ways. Now, this is an important point. The word classification here um, is, is done using a recurrent neural network. And the output of it is word probabilities. Not just the most likely word, but the word probability. And then the word probabilities are inputted into a language model. Uh, many of you know the language model is a statistical model of the sequences of words in a given language. And the language model takes the predicted word probabilities and can essentially update and correct things as it goes, okay, so in order to do some kind of predictive autocode on the ongoing sentence. The output of this is displayed back on the screen. So this is just an example of what the pedestal looks like. This is the first participant in our trial who has a pedestal here. Um, this is a port that has about 128 channels on it. And we connect it to this digital head stage. And that's what allows uh, this linkage between the computer and his brain. This is a confusion matrix that um, looks at the accuracy of the pairwise confusions uh, from the classification. Overall, it's pretty decent. I do have to say that the, um, the, um, the accuracy uh, for single words is about 50% uh, chance is 2%. Um, so um, far from perfect, but um, getting there, I would say. But remember, we're not looking for just the uh, the target word, the single word, we're looking at the probability distribution across all 50 words because the language model uses the probability distribution, not just the most likely uh, decoded word. So um, the word error rate, the chance, is, is about here. Um, without the language model, the word error rate is about 50% uh, or 47%. With the language model, it gets to about, uh, the lowest we I think had was about um, something like 90, you know, 93% um, accuracy, 7% word error. So um, language model definitely helps, and these are two kind of critical statistics. Uh, if you look at the uh, rate, it's about 15 words per minute um, using this algorithm. So in this video, uh, you see here, this is the connector that's connected to the port. Uh, the subject is going to see a prompt here on the screen, which is usually a question. And he's going to try to tell us a response that we have to decode from his brain. Effort.
through an array that's implanted, surgically implanted over the brain. And it's connected to a small connector that we can um, do uh, analog to digital um, conversion as well as amplification and um, filtering. This digital head stage is connected by a wire to a computer that does the following. The pipeline includes uh, taking in the raw signals in digital form. Uh, we do signal processing on it to extract the relevant features. The first step is an algorithm that does speech detection. It's detecting whether or not he's trying to speak a word or not. Then it, it takes those detected events, once it's detected, and attempts to classify what word is he trying to say. In this particular first project, we started with 50 word vocabulary. 50 words can generate approximately 1,200 different sentences. At least the 50 words that we chose uh, can generate 1,200 different sentences when you combine the words in different ways. Now, this is an important point. The word classification here um, is, is done using a recurrent neural network. And the output of it is word probabilities. Not just the most likely word, but the word probability. And then the word probabilities are inputted into a language model. Uh, many of you know the language model is a statistical model of the sequences of words in a given language. And the language model takes the predicted word probabilities and can essentially update and correct things as it goes, okay, so in order to do some kind of predictive autocorrect on the ongoing sentence. The output of this is displayed back on the screen. So this is just an example of what the pedestal looks like. This is the first participant in our trial who has a pedestal here. Um, this is a port that has about 128 channels on it. And we connect it to this digital head stage. And that's what allows uh, this linkage between the computer and this brain. This is a confusion matrix that um, looks at the accuracy of the pairwise confusions uh, from the classification overall. It's pretty decent. I do have to say that the, um, the, um, the accuracy uh, uh, for single words is about 50% uh, chance is 2%. Um, so, um, Far from perfect, but um, getting there, I would say. But remember, we're not looking for just the uh, the target word, the single word. We're looking at the probability distribution across all 50 words, because the language model uses the probability distribution, not just the most likely uh, decoded word. So um, the word error rate, the chance, is, is about here. Um, without the language model, the word error rate is about 50% uh, or 47%. With the language model, it gets to about, uh, the lowest we I think had it was about um, something like 90, you know, 93% um, accuracy, 7% word error rate. So um, language model definitely helps, and these are two kind of critical statistics. Uh, if you look at the uh, rate, it's about 15 words per minute um, using this algorithm. So in this video, uh, you see here, this is the connector that's connected to the port. Uh, the subject is going to see a prompt here on the screen, which is usually a question. And he's going to try to tell us a response that we have to decode from his brain effort. Blinking dots means speech detection. The blinking dots means the algorithm has detected speech intent to speak.
this last one example of the language model uh, correcting the sentence. Again, only because it keeps track of the word probabilities. Okay, so I just want to summarize. Um, we've learned a lot about this part of the brain in the last 10 years. Um, there's actually, in fact, two laryngeal areas that are involved with features. One up here that we discovered, but also a lower one that was uh, described over 100 years ago. And I'm not going to go into details, but there are, in fact, two laryngeal areas. And those are important for voicing and also pitch of the voice. Um, we've also described how brain activity in this area, when you look at single specific locations, how it encodes articulatory trajectories. And we think of these low dimensional units called speech primitives as being encoded in these particular sites. You can look at the population ensemble activity and decode it for the purpose of a neuroprosthetic. And we've shown that it is now possible to decode full words from brain activity alone, as well as some synthesized speech. So I hope uh, this was of interest to um, the ICML community. Uh, this is the really wonderful group of people that I work with and our funding sources. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Um, please, any of you ask questions or uh, reach out to me directly at UCSF, my information is online. Um, we would love to get input and advice from people in the machine learning community. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That's a very interesting talk. Uh, so let me read some questions. Um, uh, okay, so uh, the first, first question uh, from Wei Chao. When the patient is only thinking of a sentence without speaking it, will the electrodes also detect any meaningful signal? Say that again, please repeat the question. Uh, yeah, when the patient is not only thinking of a sentence, basically it's only thinking of a sentence without speaking, just think. Uh, no, will the, no, it, uh, it, only, it only picks up the activity when someone's actually trying to speak. Because this is the part of the brain that connects to speaking, so a uh, movement of muscles in the vocal tract. So this is really trying to just replace the readout of the muscle of muscular command. It's not what people are thinking. I see. So when you think, you you really do not have this emotion, and then you can't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So another question uh, is for. So I'm wondering how you found the ground truth. kinetic uh, intended by the neural activity. I think you have the electrode, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So you, you implant the electrode to the mouth, uh, to, to the mouth, right? So that's, uh, yeah, we have that's the electrode from out for we use the visual track. Um, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So Ma Marina asked, and uh, I'm wondering how much person to person variation you see mappings from brain activity to kinetics. Yeah. And from, uh, yeah. And from a uh, phoneme to kinetics. Yeah. Uh, Marina, and, so, uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Marina, that's a very uh, good question. So um, there's a lot of variable. Okay, everyone's map is actually quite different. Um, the, the sequencing within the map, the order of the larynx, the jaw, the tongue, the lips, and that sequence is the same in everybody, but the absolute position in the map is very different. Okay, so everyone's brain is different with regard to those individual, and you can imagine that because you know we have different languages and different accents, the relationship between those muscle movements and sound can also in phoneme is actually to some degree language specific. Um, one thing that we've been looking at is what we call transfer learning. Um, again, inspired by a machine learning community. Uh, for example, if you train in, uh, a model on someone to decode speech on uh, one person, can you take um, some learned representation and apply it to a new model? And the short answer is yes, you can actually do that. 
um, the mapping from the individual electrodes is very arbitrary to the representation. And that's those are the first orders, the first couple of layers. But the intermediate actually seems to be very convert, you know, very conserved across individuals. So you can use transfer learning, um, but not at the lower level, the somewhat abstracted level of representation. Does that make sense? Hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here I try to ask, uh, so you already answered that question about adaptation. Uh, how, how much fewer data you will have, I mean, you will need if you adapt to new patients using transfer learning? Well, um, with, the, with the project that I showed you just now, um, we really just have data from one subject, one person, and I don't, I don't, we need much more to answer the interesting question about transfer learning. Right now, that first subject, we pretty much had to, we had to learn. We had to learn everything de novo, you know. So we had to turn on something like nine thousand words, you know, uh, where he's just trying to say those words and we're trying to decode it. That's why it it takes a very long time if you're paralyzed. And so, um, this is not one of those conditions where you have a ton of data. Um, data is very very sparse and very laborious. So. Um, that's why we're thinking very, very hard about ways to train the model with very little data. Transfer learning okay. is one way. The other way is, you know, smart feature abstraction, really trying to think about the intermediate representation. So, so do we have uh, some patients uh, uh, in the lineup who will be interested in trying like uh, this new technology? Yeah, we are recruiting more patients for our trial. We're just really at the beginning phase. There are a lot of um, yeah, a lot of people who saw the article who are reaching out now to for my participants. So we will know. But I think in the future you could imagine that you could learn on one person and then apply some sure. of to the next. Yeah. 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 Okay. So so I will continue uh, the questions. So Matt Sardi asks, can you give some intuitive insight? Why is the same area in the brain? That's the same function in every people, as opposed to being entirely non-differentiated like a artificial neural network. I don't quite understand that. Uh, um. Yeah, it's it's a good question. So, um, so an artificial neural network is like um, it learns the connection. Right? It learns the weighting on the connections, um, but. The brain is programmed. All of us are programmed so that this part of the brain actually has direct connections to the vocal tract. Also, a different part of the brain has connection through the spinal cord to all of the different fingers and your legs. So this is very different because it's not learned; it's programmed. Um, a lot of what we're trying to do, you know, when you're doing machine learning, is to, you know, especially. Um, with speech is you're, you're trying to learn that, for example, um, the same thing with the hearing system, if you think about speech recognition, it's programmed, you know, from the ear to the brain. There's some stuff that's not programmed in the brain, but a lot of the connections to the brain and the filtering and the signal processing is programmed. Um, so when you do ASR, you, you learn it now. Um, but humans don't learn that. We are programmed with that. And then there's a second layer, for example, language, um, the speech of a given language, which is on top of the program, which is learned. So there is a part of the system that is undifferentiated and can make new connections in the cerebral cortex. But then... Really? So... Yeah. So basically you are saying some are hardwired. You cannot learn. So that's... Yeah. Uh, what if uh, that part get damaged? Can you? I mean, even you are, you are in young age. Can you actually try to recover using other part of the brain? Let's yeah. say some of them. Yeah. You can. You can. Yeah. To some extent. But if you can, then it's kind of uh, you can learn, right? Or. Yeah, but it's like if if those are the only connection for in order to to do it, you still have to have some connection to the muscle and the body. Right. So if you lose right, right. if you lose connection, there's nothing you can only think of it or whatever. So um, the 
the point is that some of these connections to the muscles are very redundant. They're distributed through different parts of the brain, not everywhere, but in very different selected parts of the brain. So you can maybe injure one, and then the other part of the body, uh, the brain has redundancy and can pick that up, but it's not the whole brain. So um, some of it is hardwired and some of it has to be learned. Obviously a lot of language and, um, and speech, like um, the phonology of different language, uh, is learned. But the connections, essentially, um, to the muscles, for example, is, is hardwired. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, let me continue the questions. So Tom Dietrich asks, does the patient report having to make multiple tries to say a word? No. We specifically instruct him to only do one. And if he, if he actually does multiple, it kind of screws up the decoder. Because the training is really all focused on single word. Uh, but but it, it's because the decoder is slow, or it's... Uh, uh, how, how does that happen? Like, uh, I know it doesn't look yeah. like real time, right? So why, why you show the video? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a couple of delays, but um, okay. So the, the easiest way I can explain it is in the current version that we just that I just showed you. Each word is decoded one by one, and you have to decode one word before you can move on to the next word. Each word trial is about uh, four seconds. That's why the total rate is about uh, 15 words per minute, because each word, we give them about three to four seconds to try to say. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So, 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 so the patient that does uh, like uh, take a three seconds to yeah, think but, or whatever a uh, word. Yeah. yeah, to try to say. And that's kind of artificial. We kind of set it at three to four seconds, because we just want to make sure they have enough time. Um, so we take the three second or four second interval. And then we, we use a um, decoder, which is a little kernel now. We're really looking for the sequence in there. And um, But as the question relates to, if you do multiple, it will screw up the decoder because the training right. really assumes that uh, it's a, a multiple single. And we instruct them to do that. OK, right. Yeah, yeah. I guess when the technology improves, then probably the interval becomes smaller, right? So eventually well, I mean, well, we, well, we faster really faster. Yeah, exactly. I mean, instead of looking at single words each trial, we should just be doing continuous, right? Um, yeah. But again, this is is challenging because think about it. Like, if someone's not speaking, you know, how do you train them on, right? It's like you know, you don't know ground truth, and you can have them try to say sentences continuously, but you really have no idea if they're saying what when. Um, I know you guys could probably figure it out, but we, we didn't figure out a good way to think about that. Just right. yet. So uh, yeah. let's just stick with the word, word by word first. Right. So, so actually, okay. for, for this particular patient, uh, there's no mouth movement, movement, right? So how, how did you get to the... Well, there, there are some, there are some, well, the ground truth is, um, okay, so good question. So ground truth in this one is, um, we, we, we tell him what word to say, and we tell him when to say it. So we assume that he's actually trying to say the word that we told him to say when we told him. That's our ground rule. So we impose that onto the study, and that's how we train it. Um, if we didn't do that, we, we would have no way of knowing what the ground rule is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have an, uh, another question, just some of my own question is, uh, so you mentioned about the two approaches. One is uh, your kinetic approach, right? The other one you say can directly to predict the phoneme and yeah. then to text, right? Can you comment on these two approaches? Uh, how, how far the other approach uh, already gone? And uh, what's the advantage of uh, yeah, I mean, the two approaches? Are, are kind of different. So the kinematic approach, I like it because um, to me, it's a very physiological generative model of speech. We create sound through the movements of the vocal tract. So if you can model that statistically, in theory, you, 
could build a general model of that and do something that sounds very natural. That's where we'd like to go, but that general model is just an existing one. So, um, so that's something we're working on right now, actually. It has a lot of advantage because that's the part of the brain is programmed for controlling movement. Um, not but, but, but what about the other, uh, other approach? Uh, there must be teams doing that approach as well, right? How, how far they have been? Well, um, I think other teams are doing pretty well too, you know, with the phoneme estimation. In fact, we did some of that ourselves as well. Um, we don't think that this part of the brain is encoding individual phonemes, like I described. It's encoding these articulatory oh. trajectories. But okay. the main advantage of using phoneme is because you can, it's much easier to use a language model, right? Um, you right. can take a text brain and it's much easier, but it's not normal. It's not like what the brain is processing. So right. each but each has each has an advantage and disadvantage. You know, one is more biomimetic, the other can leverage language. So, so there is another area of brain that will be responsible for the phonemes, right? Or, I mean, you, no. you have to use, oh no, oh, you, you still use the same same part of the brain. You say but the same brain. Yeah, and we don't really think that there's a part of the brain that um, codes phoneme. Phoneme is oh. kind of like um, it's kind of like a um, it's a concept that we have, you know, from linguistics and some degree of engineering. Got you. Helps, helps us constrain the problem, right? So we can use this, but in reality, uh, it's not what the brain uses um, at all. Got you. Got you. Uh, and uh, for the electrodes, uh, what kind of a resolution? Right now you have a 16 by 16, right? So do you see that to increase uh, significantly in the future and that will help? Uh, the, uh, well, yeah, I, I think it's critical and uh, there's a lot of open-ended questions. You know, it's not just the number of electrodes, but where the electrodes go and the area that you cover. And many of you know that Elon Musk is a company that's developing very, right. very sophisticated system uh, for Neuralink. It's very incredible. Right, right. Oh, you, can you comment on that, actually? So I'm curious about the... I mean, your I, only, I only know what's public, but I, I do think it's you know pretty incredible, the kind of technology. Um, we're also developing related technology as well that's complementary. I don't think it's competing in any way, just complementary for the purpose of speech decoding. But the well, reality is, yeah, the more data, the better. Um, the more resolution, the better. It has to be safe to do it. Um, because you right. just, yeah. Yeah. Right. So everything so, that so I just... Know, like, uh, currently, how much resolution one can expect, for example, in the next five or ten years? Well, the Neuralink device, I think, has uh, a chip that processes like a thousand pinnacle channels. And so um, there are some some companies right now looking at uh, even maybe an order of magnitude more than that, like 10,000 oh, channels. Oh, wow. Like yeah, but these are using some kind of like CMOS, sensor thing, you know, it's just, um, if I say too much about it, I'm probably going to just say it incorrectly. So, um, but yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of challenges, you know, uh, power consumption, the signal processing, how to do that all for that many channels actually becomes very, very complicated. Right. So right. Well, what we showed is actually just the very bare minimum. It's really just, proof. It's, it's like the first time, but in the future, we need more channels and fast. If any so, of you have yeah. thoughts, ideas about it, please email me. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think machine learning is more about the software, but uh, so, uh, oh, I know some of that is. Uh, oh, if you have ideas, with, uh, uh, with the yeah. hardware. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but uh, I, maybe you know, let me read you the other questions because I, I I'm a little bit off uh, with my own questions. I'm kind of uh, very interested. Um, so, uh, Marina also asked, thanks for this uh, fascinating talk. Do you know if the volunteer was speaking naturally inside of their brain? And if so, what made the translation appear slow in the movie? Oh, really good question. Um, really good question. Um, okay, so some of the slow is just because, like, like I described to you, like this is the first time we did it, so it's going to be slow. But we're still trying to figure out how to make this faster. There's a lot of computational signal processing 
And plus, we took this like three, four millisecond window. I'm sure all of you can imagine ways you can do that faster than what we described. Um, but again, remember, it's very difficult when someone's not talking in order to train the model and, and really know what you're trying to do. Um, in this particular person, you know, I asked him, well, can we do this faster, like one or two seconds per word? And he said, that's too fast. For me. So he's, he's a, even for him, he's like trying to only say, you know, one word every right. two, <clears throat> three seconds. So um, I think he, he's thinking much faster than that. There's no question about it. But part of his paralysis, I do also think, has to do with slowing you know, his ability to try to speak as well. And so um, that's yeah. something we have to, to consider. Yeah. Because he never spoke for yes, like, speaking years, for right? Yeah. Years. yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense, yeah. It always will be challenging, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, I'll continue the question. So do we think that the signal in patients that have gone many years without speaking will be any weaker or distorted than those who have lost the speech more recently? Yeah, that's a really good question. And to be honest with you, that was the one thing I was the most worried about. That, you know, we did the surgery. We had the person who couldn't speak. Then we did surgery where we opened up part of the brain and put the electrode on them. And then that part just didn't work. I mean, you know what I mean? That was my worst fear. Yeah, sure. And that was part, partly why we did the study, you know, to see if it's even possible. Right. But there are speech signals there. I don't think that they're the same. I think they are just. So, I, don't, I don't think. Right. So the are. recent, uh, if you you lose speech recently, then I think the system will work much better. Right? Yeah. You know, in some of these conditions like ALS, it might even be better to plan it before you lose the speech. If you know that it's going to happen. If you're lucky enough to right. know it, so you can at least train it before you lose the speech. Right, right, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so they continue the question. Uh, Kashif, so ask the, can the responses from the model be used as a feedback signal to the brain? Uh, for example, the, uh, the person hears the correct decoding versus the incorrect decoding. To also train or guide the model, uh, feedback signal. Uh, here, basically, uh, I think uh, he's uh, thinking about uh, uh, more automatic ways, like if your system made a mistake, the person hears that, he thought, oh, that, that, that's not correct, then, yeah. then, then that probably can generate some signal. So well, that may not be the same part of the brain, I guess, right? It's the interpretation of uh, hearing. It may, may not be the same part, I agree with you. And um, I think that's a very interesting thing we're trying to understand, which is um, part of the brain actually is monitoring the feedback. And he certainly knows if it's right or wrong. Um, in theory, we could incorporate you know, the brain's monitoring in order to help supervise the training. We, we didn't do that yet. I've thought about that. But um, again, this is just the first time we did it. So there's a lot of room to try new things. Yeah, yeah the next question actually is one I, I'm also interested to ask is, uh, is there any non-invasive uh, PCI that can do well, I mean, at all, where people has to do the surgery? I think that. A lot of people are working on it right now, but you know the skull and scalp is pretty good protection for the brain, oh. and we just have we we really just don't have the tool yet to get this kind of resolution. What I showed you is actually quite coarse, but it's still the best we have. So um, a lot of people invest a lot of money to try to figure out how to get higher resolution, like without doing the brain surgery. It's still not there yet. Do, do you think that there's a hope where, where that's uh, probably not going to happen? Um, 
I think there's always hope, but I haven't seen any technology that I think can do it. Yeah. For, for the invasive, uh, like uh, this kind of a surgery, will that be any danger or any well, side effect? Any, any, any surgery can have side effects, but what what we describe for this is an array that's just placed right, right on the brain surface. It's not going into the brain. So right. for, for nerve surgery, this is very simple kind of surgery. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, yeah, very simple. Like, even the beginning nerve surgery can do that. Yeah. As long as they put it in the right place, you know, as long as they don't like put it in the wrong part of their brain. Right. And it will stay there, right? There will be no bad effect or whatever. Yeah, oh, I mean, okay. we're, working on some, we're working on some hardware. We want it to be able to be used by even, you know, for, you know even new nourishment. It needs to be robust, right? So. Right, right, right. Oh, wow. That, 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 that's, that's good to know. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I will continue the question. Uh, how long did the ground truth training take for this patient? I think it was like yeah, actually like, how many data you get, right? Okay. Yeah, so um, I think that what I showed you was a result of something like 20 hours. So 20 hours of uh, the, the training training data or yeah. or 20 hours of, the, of the training itself? Uh, probably 20 hours of training itself. Oh, okay. Uh, do you know how many data you, you have? I don't remember how many. Oh, okay. That's okay now. Um, uh, the next question is, uh, you mentioned there is no specific area responsible for phoneme generation. And do you know how to collect the features by that method? Uh, from that point of view, I think one of the advantage of a kinetic method is that the features are more concrete. Is that right? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's okay. exactly yeah. Okay, that's great. Oh, ask the whether we are permitted to share the content. Um, I don't know. I mean, so I think that's the... Uh, I think the chat will stay... Uh, this is just the policy of the conference. Chat will stay probably for a month, and then they will be gone, gone forever. So uh, everything here. But they probably stay for, for a short time. And the video probably will stay, basically. It will be stay on the website. So that's, uh, that's general. Yeah. So I have a question about uh, what, what do you see the future of uh, this technology? And uh, it's uh, really fascinating, right? So right now, really can uh, do things which uh, hardly imagined before. But uh, what in the next uh, 10 years you think uh, uh, it will allow this kind of patients to naturally speak? Or with the, uh, how fast the technology is advancing? Well, I, I think in the next 10 years we will have something that is actually commercial, you know, like something that, not, not for consumer, but for medical. Um, I think the next 10 years will probably not be one, but maybe even two or three, um, maybe even more companies, you know, doing this kind of thing. Uh, um, for the speech or for, for the, all, all, all different kind of things? All different all kinds of things. Like robotic yeah. R, you know, vision, right. Right. Uh, right. Right. other kinds of things. Um, memory. Um, right. Memory. So what do you mean memory? So they remember things, can help you to remember things? Yeah, I mean, there's a company People are thinking about a device that can help uh, improve memory. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. It, it works by kind of like modulating the state. You know, sometimes certain brain states are more receptive to remember. So, so will that help like Alzheimer disease or? Uh, that's like what they're uh, hoping. They're hoping that it's going to help people with um, like traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's. But I don't know, you know, it's, it's so, still, Still kind of early, but natural speech, it's pretty damn hard to replace natural speech, you know. Um, but I'm hopeful we can get better. I mean, like I said, we did 50 word vocabulary. Right. 
we're trying to get to a thousand we're looking for. Right. Right, um, right. We want it to be faster. We want it to be more accurate. That's true. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, so what is the goal of Elon Musk's uh, company, Neuralink? And uh, also yeah. in the same space, right? More problem, I mean, more, more publicity. Related, you know. And, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I only know what's in the public media. And oh, okay. um, I think they're building something very interesting, you know, a very interesting kind of technology. But I don't think it will solve all the problems. It will solve a very kind of select set of problems that that device is designed to solve. The brain is very complex, and most of the brain problems can't be solved by that kind of technology. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's another question. Uh, has anyone designed a physics simulation of the kinetics of using parts of your mouth to speak? Wouldn't this help with the data imitation? I think well, it probably is a decoder part. Yeah, that's yeah exactly. I think that, that's actually a, a really good point. And that's, that's why to us the biomimetic approach is um, is interesting and promising. Because we're not trying to go from brain activity to audio. We want to go to the brain control, you know, brain decoding, the articulatory movements and the vocal tone. And then we can train on a different data set to understand the relationship between the movements and the vocal tract to sound. So we don't have to solve all of the learning from the brain. We just need to solve the side from the kinematics, you know, from the brain to the kinematics. The relationship of the kinematics to the acoustics is something we can learn from a lot of data sets that exist. You can think of it's not transfer learning, but it's just a way of learning it, trying to representation of part of the, the algorithm. But um, otherwise, you just take a lot of data to try to solve. It. Right. Yeah. So I have another question, which is uh, slightly different from uh, this. But hey, I'm just curious. You ask, how come no one's asking machine learning questions? I thought this was the machine learning. Uh, machine learning. Is, yes, I, I, I think. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I can ask a uh, machine. No, 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 go ahead. I'm just, <laughs> just joking. But these yeah. are actually good questions, but they're usually the same kind that I get in the medical conference. Oh, okay. really? Oh, good. really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I think people are kind of interested. I'm just trying to try to understand how the technology works. It's a new thing, right? People are not, they don't know. So that's, uh, for the machine learning part, I, I guess that this audience they probably can, can get an idea. The specifics of your model, they, they may need to read papers, but the, the rough idea is not surprising to to them, right? So, so probably that's why that uh, hasn't left for this audience, you know, because that's the part which has the fewer surprising factor than the other part. Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, related to machine learning, but it's not quite. Is uh, for the uh, brains uh, because you mentioned about it's hardwired and uh, some part is trained, right? For the brain and uh, the uh, machine learning models, what's the key difference? Because uh, there is uh, something, for example, for the machine learning models, they are less robust, uh, which uh, uh, a lot of uh, machine learning people are interested in that, how to solve this problem and this relationship. For example, if you hear something in the noisy environment, which will cause less trouble to humans than machines. Right, human is much more tolerant to whatever noise or things you haven't uh, seen, whatever. Yeah. Uh, is there any insight from the brain which you can at least uh, to some understanding of uh, this? Well, um, yes. Yeah. Half of my lab studies hearing, speech hearing. Today oh, okay. I focus on the uh, motor control of speech, but actually half of lab. I didn't even talk about that work at all. We study okay. about speech perception, how we hear and process right. speech sounds through the ear to the brain. And you're absolutely right. When we record from the part of the cortex, it's right here, this part of the brain. If you have two two speakers speaking simultaneously, or there's noise in the back, the brain representation is already filtered. 
you only see the representative from one voice. Um, so how does that happen, though? Through what the mechanism? Um, well, that's like a billion dollar, multi billion dollar question. But um, because if we knew the answer to that, then that, you, know, you can make a lot, you know, of progress with that. Um, we think it has to do with things like um, memory, um, attention. Um, in in the auditory, we call it scene analysis. You know, sort of integration uh, across time and across frequency. Um, all I can tell you for sure is that we see that extracted representation, but how it gets like that is still very unclear. So basically, they have better representation already once you get a signal, so you can filter out the noise or everything. Yeah, and it's happening in the audit system. Yeah. Also, it's uh, in the audit means it's the hardware part of the. Um, at least partially. Yeah. I see. So. Okay, okay. So we don't know how, how that happened, right? So <coughs> But you mentioned about uh, their connection is far, uh, far more complex than the neural network. You have uh, connections and more long range, or things like that. So will well, that help? There are a lot, yeah, I think it does help. Um, I think the challenge for us right now is a lot of people in neuroscience kind of think about the brain in a very simple way, kind of like people or linear. A hierarchical organisms like serial processing you know, from low representation to high representation people um, for example you know some people describe visual system like convolution and all that work, right like you just have yeah. an interesting receptive flow size etc but um, I think it's way too simplistic and um, at least in the auditory system that actually makes no sense mm -hmm. so um, I think the auditory system the recurrent neural network is actually a lot more useful framework. Um, but the implementation, I think, is a different story. And um, for example, we're very interested in um, um, the kind of computations you would get from a recurrent network to process sequences of sounds to generate work. You know. OK. So, um, so uh, one thing is uh, you mentioned about this kind of, uh, for example, using kind of a neural net to do the brain modeling, right? So, so it's too simple, right? Uh, so, what are the good brain modeling now? Mathematical model of brain already have. Well, in the I mean, science? yeah, I, I don't think this is going to be very satisfying to you, but um, people are now finding that. Um, that the neural networks actually can predict the brain data better than any other model right now. Oh, really? OK. So, so there, there are, are like a neur, a brain specific model. So yeah, you realize like, that a neural yeah. net is uh, currently better. It's better. Not all neural networks are better, but some are better. And they're deriving representations that we don't even have names. We don't even, we can't even think of what that representation is. We don't have a name for it. We yeah. can't even describe it, but it can predict the data. It can predict the brain response even better than any model that we have. So, so how do you measure that? You, you, you measure that still using the electrode? Yeah. Or you, yeah. Oh, so, so you're trying to predict the neural activity of the electrode. You can compare all the rule-based model or all the linguistic model or whatever to see if that can predict the activity. Um, or you could just train a big neural network and see if that can predict the activity better. And I think more and more we're seeing that the neural network definitely can predict. But we still have the fundamental problem is that we don't have the interpretation. What does that mean? You know? Right. And so that's a big yeah. debate right now in our field, which is, you know, some people say, don't even try to understand it because you will never understand it. And then other people say, well, if you can't understand it, like, that's not even science. You know, like, that's not what we should do. So there's a big debate right now, actually, in our field about, you know, 
from my perspective personally is I like the idea of no network to help generate new representation that we don't know yet. Um, but I'm still of the opinion that we should continue to seek to understand and continue to understand representation, even if right now it's difficult. At least we know that something can predict that to be better. And in some cases, it's very dramatically better. So um, I'm interested not just in the representation, but also the algorithm, um, the computation, you know, that can give rise to that. That's what I was talking about. Difference. To me, the difference between convolutional architecture versus what current is very, very fundamentally important to, to um, you know, again, with the constraints that the brain has. Um, it's very important to thinking about um, how to explain some of this activity. Interesting. Right. So, so, so we, uh, so basically, I, I see people, right? So in the early days of uh, deep learning, I, I think uh, maybe five, six years ago, they have this, uh, uh, they have a mapping of uh, deep neural nets to the visual system, like V1, V2, V3. So you have this uh, low level feature, medium feature, high level feature that correspond to the brain as well. So th this one is also, I guess it's also, you know, people kind of agree this is a reasonable model in the, in, in the, in, in neuroscience, right? Or yeah, I think so. This kind of explanation, yeah. I think so, but I, I also think that, um, that's for like the simple kind of object recognition, you know. Um, but natural vision, I think, is very different. You know, it's a little bit different. So if you're trying to, you know, um, label a picture or um, single object, you know, I, th I think that's fine. But natural vision is much more dynamic. So right. um, those kind of models are still kind of unclear, right? And, uh, right, but even I think for the simple image models, uh, there are issues, right? Like uh, in the deep neural net, we all know right now there's a lot of adversarial images. You do a very small perturbation of your input image, it completely changes your your prediction. And it uh, doesn't seem uh, you have a lot of hope of fixing this problem at this point. Yeah, there's no good way. But in human, it's much more robust. Again, it's coming back to the uh, to the yeah the robustness of uh, the system, the human never has this problem, so yeah. so there must be some things going on which is uh, quite different. Yeah, that's actually one 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 thing maybe that can be hopefully can be inspired from the brain science. Yeah, one yeah. thing is probably can help uh, the brain, but uh, also how do you solve some problem uh, currently? It's not clear how to solve. Yeah, Okay, so great. Uh, and other questions? Oh, so there's another question. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, another question come in. Do you use, uh, or try to use content of a question to boost the decoding accuracy? Um, um, language model, I guess, right? So, yeah, that's actually a funny question, a very good question. So no, in the stuff I showed you, no. But we, um, as I told you before, half my lab studies like auditory perception, right? Right. So we did one experiment where the electrode is covering the part of the brain that is encoding what you hear, but the electrode is also covering the part is what you're trying to say. Mm. So we, we did that exact experiment. So we tried to decode what question someone heard, and then we use as a prior to help constrain the decoder on what they were trying to say. Hmm. Does that make sense? Right. So that's like uh, when you hear something, it's like, uh, but, but the, the, the patient was seeing something, right? Not, not uh, hearing something. Well, I mean, it's like, yeah. uh, it's it, like it, you have a question. But, but, yeah, but the one that we did was the question was heard. So we tried oh, okay. to take what someone heard is a question. Like, for example, you know, what is your favorite instrument? Right, right. You, right. you could decode that question. Right. And you can get rid of like 99.9% .9 of all other words, right? Sure. And then your decoder is only trying to figure out, you know, one of 30 
you know, instrument or something. Right, right. It's, a, it's actually a pretty huge pirate, and I think the human brain does that, actually. You know, mm. So, um, that's what we call context decoding. Interesting. And, yeah, and actually the way that we're thinking about this in the future is really, um, you know, NLP-based, kind of, like, when people are going to be doing the decoding in the future, you know, the NLP will be boosting because it's going to keep track of the conversation, and things will be very contextual. Okay, I think we are almost running out of time, so we are, uh, what, what do you want to say to the machine learning community, I think, in the end, and then? Well, I, I think the main, the, the main thing I'd like to say is please help me, our team, help us <laughs> continue to improve. Uh, please, you know, write to us if you've got suggestions on how to do this, of course. Um, I think this is a very special time between machine learning and neuroscience, too. Um, our particular interest is not vision, it's actually on speech. And there's interesting questions both on speech motor control and speech in terms of speech synthesis, but also uh, ASR. We, we need systems that are, um, you know, resilient to low data training for practical purposes, but also uh, robust, as you described. And I think this is an extremely interesting time to be thinking about uh, exchange of ideas and thinking about models. I, I think the idea that neural network now is, in many cases, the best predictor of brain activity we have is telling us something very important and we should try to understand it as much as we can. So uh, I very much look forward to interacting with machine learning community in, in the coming years. Great, great. Okay, thank you for such a really fantastic talk. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Okay. Okay. Bye. Right, bye. Take care. Good night.